This is Applied Psychology BTEC. This is Year 2, Unit 3, and this is uh, Section C1, where we look at theories of persuasion. Uh, this is fear arousal theory, and we're going to look at the theory and also the research that goes with it. So the basic idea is that persuasive messages um, that make the recipient scared are more likely to change attitudes and behaviours. So it's all about are we arousing fear in people um, and how persuasive is that? That's really what it focuses on. Now this just tells you the background of what came before the theory. So what they thought before this theory was that the more fear you put into a persuasive message, the more likely someone was to change their behaviour. And this is basically a form of negative reinforcement because fear puts you into this horrible state where it's really unpleasant. You, you're in a, an arousal state, your heart rate is racing, you're sweating, you're tense. And what we do is we change our behaviour as the advert suggests and then that takes away the fear because we've changed our behaviour. So that's called negative reinforcement where uh, you do a certain behaviour in order to um, avoid something unpleasant. <coughs> so that's a positive correlation in what they thought beforehand. The more fear in an advert the more likely behaviour is to change. Now along came Janice and Feshbach and they came up with the fear arousal theory, which is just a little bit different from that. It basically argues that it's not a, a positive correlation, but what's called a curvy linear relationship. That just means that what they're arguing is when there's no fear or very little fear in a, in a persuasive message, that people won't change their behaviour. Because, like, what's the motivation if there's no, nothing, no fear? It's not going to motivate them to change. Then if we look at where there's really, really high fear in a message, they're saying that that doesn't help, that what actually happens is people just stick their head in the sand, they go into denial, they think, oh, well, I can't do it, or it'll happen to someone else, or they explain it away in some other way. So they're saying that actually where you've got a message with moderate fear, that's where you get the most change in behaviour. So that's called a curvy linear relationship. Um, let's have a look at the research then. So Dabbs and Leventhal um, were looking, were working with students and they sent out uh, like persuasive messages to them trying to get them to, to get vaccinated against tetanus. So the first set of communications they sent out were low fear where they basically said, oh, it's not that dangerous. Many people will just recover without like any medical intervention. Um, you know, you'll be fine was the basic message. The second lot was high fear where they basically say, oh, you're, you're going to die if you get it. Uh, you'll need to go into hospital. You'll have to go on life support. They basically totally overplayed the dangers of tetanus. And what they found out of these two, they measured both intention to have the jab and getting the actual jab. And they found that the high fear condition produced the most change. So um, this was actually showing a positive correlation. So it's back to what they thought actually before this theory. So in some ways, this contradicts it, doesn't it? Because it's showing a positive correlation rather than a curvy linear relationship. But it does also, you can say that it supports the theory because it is saying that fear arousal does make people change their behaviour. So you can use it as both support and contradiction. OK, next research study. And this is your key study for this particular area of the spec. Janice and Feshbach actually conducted their own research where they're giving um, different groups of students lectures about dental hygiene. Um, and they, again, changed the amount of, of fear in their messages. I think it was like a 45-minute lecture. It was quite lengthy. Um, but this is what they found in terms of behaviour change, actually. You've got your strong fear group. They were far more worried than the others when they were asked afterwards. But the actual behaviour change it translated into was the least behaviour change of all three. You can see that in, in the percentages here, the highest fear group actually had the least change, then the moderate fear group, and then the minimal fear group was the one who actually had the most change. So if we think about that, what it's actually showing is a negative correlation. The higher the fear, the lower the behavioural change. So can we use this to support the theory? 
Um, and the answer is, it contradicts it, doesn't it? Because it's showing a negative correlation rather than a curvy linear relationship, which was what Janice and Feshbach actually suggested in their model. However, again, it does support the idea that a high fear arousal is counterproductive productive and doesn't produce behavioral change which if you think back to the model was what they suggested low fear low fear arousal and high fear arousal they said both wouldn't produce behavioral change and it supports that idea okay if we just look at that study then the evaluation points that we've got um we've got practical applications in health campaigns again how much we it helps us um to know from this which what kind of level of fear we ought to use in a health campaign. Um, so in terms of their study, it's suggesting that we use actually minimal fear, isn't it, to produce uh, behavioural change in health campaigns. It's a really well controlled and standardised study, this dental hygiene one, and they actually did measure behavioural change, not just change that they wanted to make. Because if you, if you look back to this here, um, it's showing that the, they, the strong fear group were more worried. If you just took that kind of intention, it might have come out as different results, but their actual behaviour change was the lowest. And then if we look at weaknesses of this study, population validity again, because it's been done on students in one location. Um, it's only been done on dental hygiene, you know, perhaps behavioural change on a different topic might have produced a different result. We don't know. Um, equally, other research has contradicted it. So perhaps in this area, we can be saying that research is all finding different things and that there's not really a, a clear overall trend in the research that supports one particular point of view. So if we go back to our fear arousal theory, uh, what you would do, I haven't outlined particular evaluation points for this study, because, for this theory, sorry, because what you'll want to do is use the studies in support. You'll want to say uh, one strength would be the fact that it's supported by Dabs and Leventhal who, who found that fear arousal did make a difference. You'd then want to say, however, one weakness is that it's also been contradicted by research. For example, Janice and Feshbach actually found there was a negative correlation. So you'll, that's way how you want to talk about your strengths and your weaknesses of the theory. It's in terms of the research support or the contradictory evidence for it.